This episode is brought to you by Nebula and kind of me. If I were to ask you, what is the number one way we can reduce carbon emissions? You might say nuclear power or veganism or solar power or not flying. The problem with comparing these and trying to find the best is that there is no one method for calculating carbon emissions reductions. That work is done by research groups all over the world independently using different methods. Or at least that was the case until Project Drawdown, which I've mentioned before on the channel. In 2017, they published a book called Drawdown, which ranked solutions to climate change based on the reductions in emissions those solutions would create by the year 2050. The book's top five list looks like this. At number five, it's restoring tropical forests. At number four, promoting a plant-rich diet. At number three, reducing food waste. At number two, it's using onshore power. And topping the charts, at number one, it's Refrigeration? Basically, if people all over the world open their fridges, then the planet, on average, is inside a fridge, and so it will cool down. No, it's... it's... <laughs> don't actually do that. It all has to do with how fridges work. A fridge is basically a box that you keep cold by pumping very cold refrigerant through a long pipe inside the box. That refrigerant is a chemical in a closed plumbing loop where it goes from high pressure to low pressure, turn from a vapour into a liquid and then evaporates into a vapour again. It's a complicated process that you don't need to understand. You just need to know that you can't use any old chemical as your refrigerant. It has to be a specific kind with some specific properties. The family of chemicals most fridges use for their refrigerant Refrigerants are HFCs, or hydrofluorocarbons, which, because of their properties, are very good at being refrigerants. But they're also some of the most powerful greenhouse gases known to mankind. How powerful? We define global warming potential by the amount of warming a gas causes in the atmosphere over 100 years compared to carbon dioxide. So CO2 has a warming potential of 1. Methane has a warming potential of 25, 30. HFCs have warming potentials in the thousands. HFC 23 has a global warming potential of as much as 14,800. Which is a problem because HFCs do leak to the atmosphere at every stage in their life cycle, when you produce them, when you install them in refrigeration units, and most importantly, when you dispose of refrigeration units at the end of their life. HFCs are a significant source of carbon emissions. So why are we using HFCs? Well, originally the family of chemicals we used were chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which you may have heard of before as being responsible for destroying the ozone layer. We don't have the best track record on refrigerants. Recognising this problem, the UN agreed the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which phased out the use of CFCs and has been maybe the most successful international agreement ever. I did a whole video on how it deliberately and accidentally avoided a nightmare future. However, we replaced CFCs with HFCs and so swapped the ozone depletion problem for a carbon emissions problem. So, in 2016, an amendment was passed to the Montreal Protocol called the Kigali Amendment, which forces countries to phase out the use, manufacture and import of HFC gases. At the time of recording, 150 states, including the EU, US, China and India, have signed up to the amendment and, as far as we can tell, it seems to be working. It's not enough to just phase out the manufacture and use of HFCs. We need to destroy, via a thermal oxidation process, the refrigerants that are currently in use when a refrigeration unit comes to the end of its life. And that's something which we can do right now and is not too expensive. And this is what Drawdown estimates is the number one way we can reduce our carbon emissions. Drawdown estimates that 87% of HFCs used as refrigerants can be collected and destroyed rather than being vented to the atmosphere. And doing so by 2050 would prevent the equivalent of 89.7 gigatons of CO2 being emitted. Note that the actual tonnage of emissions of HFCs would be much lower, it's just that HFCs are so much more potent than CO2. On top of that, if the Kigali Amendment is implemented as planned, that would prevent the equivalent of up to 78 gigatons of CO2 being emitted. So by phasing out and destroying HFCs, that's a colossal 167.7 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent not being emitted to the atmosphere. 
almost double the impact of rolling out onshore wind, equivalent to four and a half years of current emissions. Just from fridges. I love refrigerators. Except it's not just from fridges. And this is where things get a bit more interesting. Because where else do we use refrigeration units? Air conditioners. Functionally, they're fridges with fans. As the planet warms, and in particular we see more and more extreme heat events, the demand for air conditioning is going to grow, especially in places where the middle class is growing, such as Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Places that, for the most part, have contributed the least to climate change, and yet are expected to bear the brunt of increased heat stress. So it's vital that we phase out the use of HFCs and start using alternatives now, before that boom happens. Fortunately, there are lots of alternatives already in use, notably refrigerant R290, better known as propane. <laughs> Some alternatives, including propane, are flammable, which is a risk, but they're used in very small quantities in these units and have been used in heat pumps without incident. If you'd like a long list of alternative refrigerants, then Greenpeace has this very long document you can check out. When considering any proposed action to reduce carbon emissions from a thing humans do, you have to consider two factors. Firstly, how large current emissions from that thing are, and so the maximum possible savings. And secondly, how easily, with current or near future tech, those savings can be achieved. Refrigeration is a winner on both counts. A huge source of emissions that you likely weren't aware of before you watched this video, but also a source of emissions that we can remove almost entirely thanks to many alternatives being available. In this case, the action is simple. Phase out the use of HFCs, which we're doing, and ensure that refrigerants are destroyed rather than emitted to the atmosphere when a refrigeration unit comes to the end of its life. Both of these are only possible with legislation. They are two actions that you wouldn't do unless you had some government policy telling you you need to do them. Coordinated climate policy is the way we're going to get out of this mess. And sometimes it's going to involve legislating things that may seem too small to make a significant impact. But don't be deceived. Replacing refrigerants is a significant and easy win in reducing our carbon emissions. But as Drawdown demonstrates, it's just one of a vast array of solutions necessary to bring our emissions down to zero. There is no silver bullet when it comes to climate change, but there is silver buckshot. And as the Montreal Protocol demonstrated, targeted international legislation works. If we break the problem down and attack it piece by piece, sector by sector, we can do this. And some solutions may surprise you, such as a law that replaces the fluid in your fridge. I hope that you came away from this video informed about HFCs, aware of the Kigali Amendment, and understanding that the solution to climate change is buckshot, not bullet. You may have noticed, by the way, that this video is in an ABA format, which is aimed at a younger audience with moderate science capital. This right here is how I define what video I'm going to make before I write a script. Over the many years I've done this job, I have built up a personal method of how I make videos, which is a little different to how other science channels operate. If you like my videos, and you'd like to learn how to make videos like them yourself, then you should consider checking out my seven part course on how to turn data into stories. Available right now on Nebula classes, accessible to everyone who has Nebula. In the class, you'll learn about how I define a video. You'll learn how I frame scientific ideas in a storytelling format. I go into detail about how I structure my videos and talk about how I design and include figures and data visualizations. Throughout the class, you'll see me conceptualize, structure, and write a video on the Antarctic impossibility of 2002, which when you're finished with the class, you can watch as a finished video exclusively on Nebula. This is the first time I've put all this stuff together in a class, and I'm really proud of it. And it's just one of many classes available on Nebula. If you'd like to learn more about the practical side of making videos, then you could check out Patrick H. Willems or Rene Ritchie. Or you could learn about something entirely different, like Business 101, or how to produce a pop song. If you're not aware, Nebula is the streaming service co-owned and operated by a whole bunch of educational YouTubers, including me, where over 600,000 subscribers enjoy ad-free content before it's available on YouTube, and enjoy exclusive Nebula originals 
channels, such as Real Time History's series on the Soviet nuclear program, as well, of course, as all the classes I mentioned. You can get access to Nebula with a subscription, which could be monthly or annual. And if you use my link, which will be linked down there, go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, you get 40% off an annual subscription, which works out to be about $2.50 a month. And for that, not only do you get access to all this incredible stuff, you also directly support the creators that you watch on Nebula. I really hope that you do check out my course. I think it's very good, and I think it can teach you a lot about science communication in general and how to make YouTube videos specifically. That link again was go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark for 40% off a subscription. With thanks to Nebula and me for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video. This was a video topic that, with a little bit of backstory, my patrons chose for me. If you would like to choose a video topic for me to cover a month, get access to behind the scenes vlogs and directly support me making more videos, then please do consider checking out my Patreon. The names on screen right now are my lovely executive producer patrons. If you learned something from this video, tell you what, pay it forwards. Pop this video in a group chat or a Discord or a subreddit or wherever. And if you enjoyed the video, please do also pop it a like. That just leads me to say thank you very much again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.